There's no excuses to not hear you singing. <laughs> no excuse. No, I'm kidding. You can worship however you wish, right? Yes. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day, God, and this new part of our life together, all of us um, in your kingdom, God. We we just thank you that we've been, as Pastor said, we're praying that we've gotten this church has gotten through the pandemic um, without any losses and very, very few people lost. We're just thankful, God, for you and that we can trust you, God, and that you just pour your love over us. And um, if we open our eyes, Lord, we see it more and more. And I just pray that you would open our eyes, God, to see you, to see um, all the blessing that we can't see when we're cloudy. And I just thank you that you have the ability to do that instantly. By your Holy Spirit, and we just thank you, God. Walk among your people this morning, Lord. Be blessed by our, by our worship, God, from a deep part of our soul and from our heart, Lord. Just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
like that's going to take the sting or get. I enjoyed that. However, you made some good points just now, yet we all know how the ship goes. When I researched the impact of the English word but on the human psyche, it was a very interesting thing to learn about the neural linguistics in the programming methods and insights a person can employ to change the way they think, the way they feel, and the way they respond when they hear the word but. It's used in a context to them as a person. And it's interesting because we can hear the word but in other contexts and it doesn't bother us at all. But if it comes framed in a way like I just shared with you, suddenly it has a whole different appreciation. According to researchers, we can learn to utilize the neuro-linguistic programming methods and insights to be more in charge of our thinking and our feeling and our behaviors, to manage our own lives more successfully, and to communicate with others more effectively. The neuro-linguistic programming is an ever-flowing collection of information and insights in how we as human beings function. And this is backed up by a huge range of mental neuro-linguistic programming techniques that can enable us to improve how we not only think and feel and, and behave and assist others in how to do it as well. Now, I'm no clinician, but all of this made me wonder how if people understood the magnitude of two best words found in all of Scripture, could that change the way they think, feel, and behave in context with the word but? So I determined, prayerfully, that I would include in our message today how learning how and when and where and why to use the word but in our communication with God and with ourselves and with others is not just one example of such insight. It's the best example. We see God's word uses the word but in the best possible way. I believe it's the greatest use of the word but I've ever heard read or seen, and it's the reason, I believe, for absolute rejoicing. I want you to stand with me this morning in honor of reading God's Word as we look in Ephesians chapter 2 at this incredible, incredible verse. Ephesians chapter 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to Course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, read that with me, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself 
he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. I reconciled them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the message of hope and help and healing we find in your son Jesus. This is the promise of God that negates everything that came before but God. So I pray today, wherever we are, in right relationship or mildly right relationship or not in right relationship with you, wherever we are, Lord, in walking with you or not walking with you, God, I pray that you would open our eyes that we would see the truths of this world, ears that we might hear the truths of this world, our eyes and ears and our minds open to the truths of this world, and our hearts that we be receptive to the change that the truth of this world wants us to. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. In all God's peace. Amen. You may be seated. Number one, you, me, we, we're dead. We don't like to think of ourselves as sinners in need of a Savior. <coughs> but right here in God's Word, Paul the Apostle says, you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. It's, it's hard for people to think that in a, in a culture that constantly reinforces that we all have our own choices to make and we all can, can, can choose what we want to do and we're free to make those decisions. We have this idea that we have free will to choose to make those decisions. When in fact, this text reveals to us that apart from being born again in Christ Jesus, we are prisoners of sin, death, and hell, and obedience not to ourselves, not to God, but to the powers of the prince of this realm, Satan. Amen? Amen. I'm a good person. I want to do good things. I, I make good choices. I try to be a nice person. I try to do good things and live my life nicely and neatly and friendly and kind to everybody else. I don't do wrong things. Good for you. You're still a prisoner of war. You're still a prisoner of bondage to sin, death, and hell. It says, you are dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked in accordance to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the, the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. You see, that very clearly makes it set up for us that there are not, in fact, three different categories. There are not those who are lost, those who are trying, and those who are born again. There are only two types of people according to Scripture, those who are lost and those who are found. Amen? Amen. There is no middle ground. You're either with him or against him. It's just that simple. John MacArthur writes in his commentary, this is a sobering reminder of the total sinfulness and lostness from which believers have been redeemed. N indicates the realm or sphere in which unregenerate sinners exist. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. It doesn't matter how much good you think you do. What matters is, is did you lean on totally for your mercy, grace, and love and faith forgiveness in Christ? If you are not found in him, here's the clue. You're not in him, and there's no salvation except in him. Amen? Amen. 
Acts 4 and 12 teaches us there is no other name given under heaven by which men can be saved. Yet we want to have this pretense that if I lead a good life and just do enough good things and try not to wrong other people, then surely God won't discount me. If God was a merciful, loving, and just God, surely he wouldn't discount that. And that would flip to the other side. Thing that the angels who are around God 24 7 say about him is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They won't say loving, loving, loving. God calls his people to be holy, meaning set apart for his use, cut away from the world different from the rest. You can't be your own person and be his at the same time. Father continues, the words of the course of this world refers to the world order of humanity's values and standards apart from God and Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul re refers to these ideologies that are like fortresses <coughs> in which people are imprisoned and need to be set free and, and brought captive to Christ in obedience to the truth. We find people arguing from just such fortresses. Well, I'm a good person. Well, I haven't ever done anything wrong. A famous evangelist asked a simple question. Have you ever told a lie? You ever stolen anything? <clears throat> you ever looked at a person of the opposite sex with lust? Yes. You ever coveted anything that belonged to someone else? Of course. Well, according to God's word, then, that makes you a liar, a thief, an adulterer, and a covenant. You've broken already four of God's commandments. And the Word of God also teaches that if you break even one of those, you're guilty of breaking them all. Amen? Amen? And then it goes on even further and says that the wages of that sin is death, separation from God forever. So now you've got this problem. You've got this sin issue, and you're going to stand before a holy and righteous God in condemnation of that sin. You had no way to make it right. In fact, you weren't even interested in making it right. In fact, even if you knew how to make it right, you couldn't. That's, that's where Jesus comes into the picture. You see, Paul refers to these ideologies as fortresses and they need to be brought free, set free from those things, and captive to Christ. And captive to Christ here literally means to be bought into and purchased by, redeemed in Christ. Obedient to the truth. We, we need to remember that we were dead in our offenses and sins. Two, here's the good news. But God, we had no hope. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the boundless riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The words mercy and love, salvation, is for God's glory, putting on display his boundless mercy, grace, and love for all of those who were spiritually dead because of their sinfulness. God literally took the idea that, that we were so dead, so lost, so gone, 
we could not come anywhere close to being good enough. You know, some of the imagery we have is, oh, we were, we were drowning. Well, that implies that there's still some life there. Let's be perfectly clear. You weren't drowning. I wasn't drowning. We were dead. We were not just close to the top. We were on the bottom. It was over. What God did didn't pluck out and rescue someone who was dying. <laughs> what God did in his miraculous mercy, grace, and love in Christ Jesus was go all the way down to the very bottom and fish around for whale food. And pull this up. Breathe new life into us. Clean us up and set our feet on solid ground. Amen. When we get the image of what Paul was conveying, we get how hopelessly lost our situation was. And we can't fully appreciate that until we recognize just how desperate our situation was. There isn't a person in this world who doesn't need God desperately. There isn't a person in this room who will have anything of merit to God and say, but I deserve this. There isn't a person in this room that hasn't been described in Scripture in this text and then doesn't have access to what God's word says, but God, being rich in mercy, for his sake. Man, it's hard. This problem in the church, and we forget that we were once they, the lost. Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, and he's saying, Look, I want you to understand the promises of God are yes and amen. And I want you to understand how good God is, that you were this way. We were. We were dead. But God, the emphasis shifts from how good we are to how good he is. Amen? amen. When we get that, salvation is for God's glory. Put on display his boundless mercy, grace, and love for those who were spiritually dead in their trespasses. God made us alive together in Christ Jesus by his grace, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the boundless riches of his mercy, grace, and love, his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It isn't anything that we can say or think or do. It isn't any merit that we bring. It isn't because you grew up in the church, or you were raised in the church, or you came to church, or you're always at church. It doesn't matter whether you're a pastor, a deacon, an elder, a, a Sunday school teacher, a ministry leader, a worship leader. It doesn't matter. Far more than anything else, a spiritually dead person needs to be made alive in God, because he's the only one who can make that happen. Salvation brings spiritual life to the dead. The power that raises believers out of death and makes them alive is the same power of the living God who moved over the dead and lifeless body of Christ in the tomb. It's a perfect picture of exactly what he wants to do in a believer's life. You and I were dead. The tomb was closed. We were wrapped up in our sin. We had no power to change our situation. It was over. How the Holy Spirit moves over us, sets us free from the bondage of death, the sin that binds us, and he rolls back the power of the, the tomb that holds us in place, and he lets us go. Nothing can hold us back. He raised us up together, makes us sit together. The tense is raised and, and indicates that this is immediate and direct results of salvation. This isn't something that could happen, might happen. It will happen at the moment of salvation. Amen? I had a long-running discussion about the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
moves over the person. And that Holy Spirit isn't just a small portion. You're going to get all the Holy Spirit, and he's going to take over you more and more as you surrender more and more yourself to him. Right? What's really cool is, that's just a down payment of what's to come when you're with him in person. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who does the transformational work. We receive a supernatural blessing of God right then, right there. We not only move from dead in sin and alive to God, we move through from unrighteous to righteousness in Christ Jesus. He enjoys all of God in that moment and growing in God every moment after that. We see through Christ's resurrection what only can be done by God. We see this in the text. We find ourselves one blessing after another blessing after another blessing. Salvation is as much for the believer's blessing, but even more for the purpose of eternal glorifying God. For bestowing on believers is endless and limitless. That's Jesus. The whole of heaven glorifies him for what he's done. We see an incredible thing taking place. But God changed everything. What we were on one side of life to something totally different on the other side. Three. So remember that you were separate from Christ. This is what I alluded to a moment ago. The church means not to forget, but to remember. Paul writes, therefore remember that you previously, you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Why would God's word want to remind us to remember where we came from? People don't like to be reminded of what they've done wrong, where they've come from, the mistakes they've made. God's word is now challenging us to remember. Remember what I saved you from. The only answer can be not to discourage us but to remember those who are in bondage still. Amen? Amen? So that we don't get this attitude, it's us and them. There's two types of alienation. First, between the Gentiles and the Jews was social, resulting from an animosity that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles for thousands of years. Jews consider Gentiles to be outcasts, Objects of derision and reproach. The second more significant was alienation because of spiritual purposes. The Gentiles, as a people, were cut off from God in five different ways. They were without Christ, the Messiah, having no Savior and no Deliverer, without divine purpose or destiny. Two, they were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. God's chosen people, the Jews, were a nation whose supreme king and lord was God himself, from whose unique blessing and protection the Jews benefited. Three, Gentiles were strangers from the covenants of promise, not able to partake of God's divine covenants in which he promised to give his people a land, a priesthood, a people, a nation, a kingdom, and a king, and to those who believe in him, eternal life in heaven. Four, they had no hope because they had been given no divine promise. Five, they were without God in the world. While Gentiles had many gods, they did not recognize the true God because they did not want him. Romans 1, 18, 26, 22. We are to remember what God has saved us from. But that's not the end of the story. We're not just dead in our trespasses and sins, but God being rich in mercy, grace, and love renewed us 
create us alive together with Christ. Paul continues in verse 4. But now in Christ you have been brought near. It's important for us to remember that we were once lost, but now we are found. We've been brought now, brought near. But now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier, the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the wall, composed of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that in he himself might make the two one new person, in this way establishing peace, and that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by having it put to death the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints of our God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Those who were far off have brought near. A common term in rabbinical writings used to describe the Gentiles, those who were not of the faith. Brought near implies every person who trusts in Christ alone for salvation, Jew or Gentile, is brought into spiritual union and intimacy with God. This is the reconciliation of 2 Corinthians 5 18 through 21. The atoning work accomplished by Christ's death on the cross washes away the penalty of sin and ultimately even its presence. He himself is emphatically indicating that Jesus alone is the believer's source of all peace. There isn't another name. There isn't another way. There isn't another gospel. There isn't another spirit. There isn't another church. It is him alone. Paul is saying is a symbolic of all of this. The text that reads, abolished in his flesh, the enmity means through his death, Christ abolished the Old Testament ceremonial laws, the feasts and sacrifice, which separated Jews from Gentiles. God's moral law. Summarized the Ten Commandments and written in the hearts of all men in Romans 2.15 is not abolished, but assumed in the new covenant. It reflects his nature, his holiness. The term one new man means Christ doesn't exclude anyone who comes to him, and those who are his are not spiritually distinct from one another. As a pastor of the church, that's my title, but my foremost identifier is a believer in Jesus Christ. My foremost identifier is a disciple follower of God who wants to worship him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. A brother to you in Christ Jesus. I'm not better. I'm not smarter. I'm not more spiritual. I'm just following the calling that God has given me using it to be a blessing to you and bless me. The new man translates the Greek word something completely different. It isn't just that they are now Jews and Gentiles in the midst of them. This is a new creation in Christ. This is a new being. Something that was never before. They are first being different in kind and in quality, spiritually, a new person in Christ is no longer a Jew or a Gentile, only a Christian. Jews and Gentiles are brought together through Jesus Christ to worship Him with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
No sinner has any right or worthiness in himself or herself to access God. But believers have been granted the right access through faith in Jesus Christ. We can come before him as a child of God in Christ Jesus, an heir to the throne. Notice the words, fellow citizens with the saints. God's kingdom is made up of the people from all time who have trusted him. You know, when I was a much younger believer, I used to say, man, I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm going to talk to Peter. I'm going to talk to John. I'm going to talk, talk to Daniel. I'm going to talk to Joseph. And then I can't wait to see those guys. Of course, they're all after I talk to the temple Lord. I can't wait to thank the Lord for all these things. Now I meet some really cool people. And some of the people I've known in my life that have helped me become a believer, I can't wait to thank them for their influence in my life. I can't wait. And then it dawned on me the other day as so I was preparing my message. How cool it's going to be that somebody's going to go up to me and say, I just wanted to come and thank you for being faithful. Oh. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for all the people that you put in my life. People who prayed for me that I didn't even know about. People that you brought across my path to, to nudge me gently through your kindness or your words, to, to take the right path and do the right thing and to grow in, in Christ likeness. And even for those people who weren't so nice and warm and pleasant, you know, the Lord challenged me to go deeper in my faith. Because if it wasn't wasn't for, for them, well, I wouldn't be the man I am still. I can't take just the good. I have to take those that are not. So Lord, I want to thank you all of these members of the household of God. Now, let me just give you a caveat. There's some of y'all thinking, well, Ray, I'm going I'm to jump up and start heaping up on more criticism of the pastor style. And I'm going to come back to The Father bestows on all of us exactly what we need and how we need it, and he uses all of us. As important as all of them were, they were not important as individuals as they were corporately. We matter to God as individuals. Yes, we matter to the world and to God and as to each other because of whose we are. Now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So that's my case for proclaiming how the words but God are two of the most powerful and peace invoking words in all of Scripture. To truly appreciate what I mean is to first appreciate just how desperate a situation we're in. I want to share with you. I listened this week to a song, and I haven't heard it for many years. The lyrics of that song was something like this. From the moment man first disobeyed the thought, we were then held captive by our sin. The law of God demanded a sacrifice, restoring to himself his own glory. So the Lamb of God was freely offered, atonement for our sin forevermore. I think about those words. I think about the truth of those words. And I, I read into the song that says that. Those nail-pierced hands reached up to God and down to man. The Lamb of God was slain. On the cross, as those nail-pierced hands reached up to God and down to man, I said to him, forgive him. As if I never said. the lamb, the, the layers were washing open. I was in here in my office having a ooh kind of moment. Was it? I think Stephen Paltrow's word. He said, we weren't just sort of dead in our trespasses and sins. We weren't mostly dead with some hope of bringing ourselves back to life. We were completely and totally dead with no hope at the spiritual end. We also were actively following Satan, doing the things that pleased him rather than God. 
We loved our sin and sin with great pleasure. We carried out both the passions of the flesh and the wicked desires that dishonored God. And to top it all off, the wrath of God was upon us when we continued to be oblivious to that of death sentence. In fact, the scriptures say we were by nature children of wrath because we were born with a wicked, sinful nature. The wrath of God was upon us from the moment we were born. It's zero hope. God. God comes to terms with who we were. What we've done. We weren't neutral to it. Doobie Brothers years ago sang a song, Jesus is just all right with me. Truth of it is, is, Jesus was not just all right with us. We were opposed to God, opposed to Jesus, and opposed to the Holy Spirit because we were slaves to sin and foolishness filled with malice and hatred towards each other and to God. To say we're in a bad shape spiritually is an understatement. I totally agree with what Arthur is saying. That's why I believe the words of what God is doing the most Book in the words of the powerful that they not only show us the power of what God could do, what only God could do, but meaning that powerful in that He is. Peace in both meaning that God did what needed to be done and Christ did. It's finished, it's completed. Nothing else needs to be done. It is by Christ alone, grace alone, by faith alone. Amen. And just to us. We see the totality of God's power, God's plan, God's purpose. God's peace brought together to do what needed to be done. Maybe, maybe what I like best is the word of John Piper for me. Look at this. He writes, the wisdom of God devised a way for the love of God to deliver sinners from the wrath of God while not compromising the righteousness of God. Wow. I wish I could just that. But you know what? I may not be eloquent enough to put something like that together. But I'm spiritual enough in Christ to recognize that it's true. See, we were sinners in need of a Savior. But God intervened on our behalf, and now we are saints who have been saved by our Savior. Praise God for His mercy, His grace, and His love. We're going to move now into the Lord's Supper. Today I want you to partake and think of it this way. Where would your life be but for the Bible? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord Himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this represents my body which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in affectionate remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy of him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A person must prayerfully examine himself and his relationship to Christ. And only when he has done so should he eat bread or drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without solemn reverence and heartfelt gratitude for the sacrifice of Christ eats and drinks the judgment on himself that he does not recognize the body of Christ. That careless and unworthy participation is the reason why many among you are weak and sick and in number sleep in death. But if we evaluated and judged ourselves honestly, recognizing our shortcomings, Correcting our behavior, we will not be judged. And when we fall short and are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined by the Lord of His correction, so that we will not be condemned to eternal punishment of our own.
night he was betrayed, he took the bread. And he gave thanks and broke and said, This is my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this perfection. Supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is to be covenant, ratified, and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in affection and remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're symbolically proclaiming the fact that the Lord's death. I hear your voice. I see 